All right, how's it going y'all? With Black Friday fast approaching, this video is gonna be on what Synology to buy, and we're really gonna be breaking out by the different features available in a Synology. And so that way you'll be able to take this information and apply it essentially wherever. And I've also created a tool on my site that goes through the most popular Synology options and actually will show you, hey, this has this, 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 and this feature and a link to it on Amazon. All right, so first I wanna start off by talking about probably the three most important things to look for when you're buying a Synology. First off is obviously the size. Are we doing two and a half inch or three and a half inch hard drives? This video is mostly gonna be focusing on three and a half inch options because while the two and a half inch market can be really good, but it's really for niche use cases. I would recommend going three and a half inch hard drives unless you really want super small, super power efficient and quiet drives. But honestly, it's a very niche market because you just don't have the huge storage capacities that are available with three and a half inch hard drives. But there are a few two and a half inch bays available. And if you're planning on going all SSD just for the quiet and the power draw, it's not a bad option, but I'm gonna call that pretty niche. And so it's not gonna be mentioned too much in these videos. And then the second most important thing is obviously the number of bays. I've kind of broken this down into one, two, four, and five plus bays for the different people and their different use cases. And finally, closing out the top three list is the networking connections to it. There are tons of different options with Synology. You can go from a one, one gigabit connection to four, one gigabit connections, all the way up to two, 10 gigabit connections, expandable up to four gigabit connections. And so there's a lot of different options there depending on what you need. All right, so that's a brief list of the top three things to look for. We're gonna be going over those in more depth, as well as a bunch of other things to really make sure you find the exact NAS you need, given that there are so many options. All right, so before we go through the list of all the different things to watch out for when you're buying a Synology NAS and what is right for you, I wanna start off by going over the naming convention for NAS units, because it can be kind of confusing if you're not used to it. Synology has a lot of different naming conventions here. So first off, we're just gonna go through Synology's series on their product page. And we're gonna go down the list and explain at least what each one of them does. So first off, we have the FS series, which stands for Flash Station Series. Basically, these are all SSD, incredibly fast, incredibly powerful IOPS. And it's really for VM backends and things like that, and things that need incredibly low latency for applications. Very few people are gonna be purchasing these. These are really just ultra high enterprise models that are only for people who really know what they're doing and are probably not watching this video. Down in the same sense are the SA series, which stands for SAS series. These series are incredibly expandable because they actually support daisy chaining a bunch of different expansion units, up to 180 drives in some cases. So this is once again, just for your ultra enterprise users who need to use SAS drives and have just a ton of storage backend. So I would also say these are not for the normal people. Another thing for those who don't know, these are rack mounted, which means you need special hardware to house them. Otherwise they just sit on a desk and they are going to be incredibly loud and run hot. So this is not something you're gonna to wanna to put in your home or even honestly in an average server closet unless you have some pretty good dampening and don't care about the sound. These are really for very enterprise users. Now we go down to the XS series. These are really for giant storage volumes for people who just need a lot of storage but don't need absolutely insane performance. Now don't get me wrong, these will easily saturate a 10 gigabit connection for the most of them. However, they are not the insane IOPS that you get with the FS series or the SAS series. These are going to be very powerful and be able to store a lot of things. All right, so this is where a lot of small or medium sized businesses who have tons of storage needs probably end up because they just need a lot of storage. This is like video production houses and things like that who are constantly needing more and more storage and it gives you a really great package. This is a great 16 bay NAS that is rack mountable. So that is just really a great form factor for tons of storage for honestly, a pretty small package for what it is. And now they've even got some desktop ones as well. All right, and so now we're gonna go down to the Plus series. These are the slightly more upgraded NASes for kind of the IT enthusiast slash small business who really want to be able to start doing extra things on their NAS. They have a huge range of them. They generally have higher performing CPUs, expandable RAM, more bays, and will support the advanced features such as BTRFS, Docker, and virtual machines. And so this is really where you start getting into IT enthusiasts, 
and something that's actually reasonable to have at your home or business if you don't need a ton of storage, but still want some pretty decent performance. Though sometimes I do wish I could afford and have room for a FS series just for fun. I would never be able to saturate one tenth of the connection, but it'd be really cool. And so now we're gonna go down and we're gonna go down to, into the value series. These are in between the J series and the plus series. And so they're, they're pretty dependable. A lot of them will support BTRFS, but it's kind of a 50-50 thing. And it's overall a pretty good option if you don't need a ton of performance out of it, but still would like to do things like link aggregation and things like that. So this is a good place for people who just need a NAS, but don't wanna be slowed down by it. And many of these just kind of have features that are not available in the J series, but you don't need to spend the money for the plus series because you're not going to be doing a ton of performance things on it. So this is a good spot for people who really don't need that much, but want to be able to run BTRFS and possibly even a Docker container in some instances. And finally, we're going to round off and go down into the J series. These are your cheapest, lowest performing NASes but honestly are a great starting place for people who really just need storage and maybe a backup. Honestly, it's a really cheap place to get into, and if you're not trying to do it a lot, and you really just want storage that's available on your network, this is a great place. You're still going to be able to run a lot of things on there, a lot of great Synology's apps, and so if you don't need a lot of performance, these are not a bad place to be. You can set them and forget them, they're gonna be incredibly low power draw, and honestly, just work. All right, and so now let's talk about the two letter code that goes in between every name. So for example, I have a DS1819+, plus, and so the two letter code for that is DS, which stands for Disk Station, which means that it is a desktop NAS, meaning it's not rack mountable, and it just fits like a normal computer tower on your desk. And generally they're pretty quiet. Honestly, you could have one right here, and you would not even be able to pick it up on my mic. I've got a DS1819+, plus, which has eight bays, but is still incredibly quiet. So generally they're very quiet and power efficient, though some models that will differ. Then there are also the FS for flash series, SA for SAS series, and RS for rack station. Basically these are disk stations, however they are rack mountable, which means you need special hardware unless you just wanna awkwardly set it on top of a desk. But generally, if you have rack mount equipment, you're going to want an RS series, though they are more expensive than their DS counterparts for the same performance in general. And finally, there is one additional code, which is NVR, which is network video recording. These are series that actually have built in GPUs that are designed to handle massive amounts of IP cameras and be able to do things like deep learning and people counting and a lot of awesome features. Those are very specific to companies who need to have surveillance and Synology is an awesome job with Surveillance Station, and so if you need a lot of cameras, you're gonna to wanna to look into this system. They're really powerful, and honestly, pretty well-priced, I'd say. And so those are the different two-letter, and in one case, three-letter codes that say which model of NAS it is based off of its form factor and its intended use case. Then let's go into the next numbers. So once again, it's DS1819+. So the 18 in DS1819+, stands for the number of hard drives that can be attached to it in total. It does not have 18 bays standalone, it has eight bays. However, it has two expansion ports with each one of them being able to handle five extra drives. So that means it's got a total of 18 drives. I kind of don't like the fact that they name it like that because honestly, I don't think a lot of people want to have expansion units. They're actually pretty cumbersome to use because you really should not be creating a volume that spans across an expansion unit and the regular unit. This is because if that cable fails, the volume crashes and it's unrecoverable in some instances. It is not as good as ZFS, where if a volume goes offline, it just becomes read only and you're able to get it back online and work. You can have some data corruption if it, the line failed. And so that's why you only want to create a volume on one specific unit. That way, if the cable fails, the whole volume goes offline all at the same time meaning you don't have any data corruption or data loss, hopefully. And so that's why it's a DS1819 plus instead of a DS819 plus. It's really just so that they can put up those bigger numbers. So you have to look exactly what it is. Generally, the expansion units come in five, so it's not too hard to figure out, but it is kind of annoying trying to figure out exactly what model it is because I wish they would just include the number of bays built in. And finally, for the 19, that last two digits is the year. And this is car company style model year, 
where they release the 21 series already and it's only November, they like to give you a couple month head start to think you're buying things in the future. And so a model released in 19 would be a ending in a 19. Then after that, there's some special codes. Plus series will get a plus at the end. Two and a half inch base will get a slim at the end. Excess will get an excess and sometimes even an excess plus. And if it's got redundant power supplies, you can get an RP at the end. And so those are the different codes. There's even more of them. And the naming convention does not necessarily follow for the higher enterprise SAS and FS models, but for what most people are gonna be buying, those should stand true. Also the J stands for the J series. Not sure where that came from, but that's what it is. All right, so now that we've gone through the naming convention for the Synology NASes, we can now go through and start talking about the most important things to look for in a Synology NAS, depending on what model you need and who you are and what you're gonna be using with it. And so these are not in order of the most important things. Everybody's gonna have different things that are more or less important to them, depending on their use cases. But these should be the most important things you should look forward to in general. And the questions you should really be asking yourself, trying to figure out what model of NAS you need. So first off, obviously the price, but hey, that's depending on the model and everything like that. And so next off, we're going to go over the two and a half inch versus the three and a half inch hard drives. And we're not going to be including the flash station stuff or the SAS stuff here, because that's really outside of most consumers or small and medium sized businesses, unless they have very niche use cases. If you're buying the SA series or the FS series, you know what you need and you know why you need it already, or you just have a lot of money, in which case, send me money, my PayPal's in YouTube. So the breakdown between a two and a half inch and a three and a half inch drive really comes down to what you need. Most of the time, if you need performance and a large amount of storage, you're gonna to wanna to go with the three and a half inch options. They're going to be a little bit louder and draw a little bit more power, but they're going to have so many more options for drives. Two and a half inch is great if you really need a tiny drive and you like to use SSDs because you wanna have a very low power draw. And honestly, SSDs have gotten pretty cheap. You can get a pretty decent one terabyte, two and a half inch SSD for about a hundred bucks. And I'll leave a link to my favorite one in the description below. It's the SK Hiex, which actually has amazing performance and I just keep buying them and putting them in my ZFS build because they are really cheap and honestly, give you really good performance. So I would really only recommend going the two and a half inch series if you've got a really good reason to. But honestly, for most people, it's just not worth it because you don't have that much storage available to you. And if you go spinning disks, they're not gonna be that much quieter. They are going to be a little quieter and draw a little bit less power, but you're still gonna have your back against the wall because of the form factor. So then after that is probably the most important thing once you've made your decision, and that is the number of bays. And I'd say that most people fall into one in four categories on number of bays. One bay, two bays, four bays, and five plus. And so it really depends on what you're gonna be using your NAS for and what your budget is. So one bay is a very niche market because it does not offer any kind of redundancy. So hard drive redundancy comes in the form of RAID or Synology's SHR. So SHR1 means that you have one drive of failure protection, meaning whatever your RAID is, one drive can fail and you still retain all of your data. SHR2 has two drives of failure protection. And the way this is accomplished is using complex math and also costs you a drive. So if you have one drive of failure protection, you lose one drive of storage. So on a eight bay NAS, if you fill it up with eight hard drives, all that are 10 terabytes, and you put in SHR1, you will lose one hard drive of data, giving you 70 total terabytes. Then DSM will take about 10% off the top, both for its own file system, and also to make sure you don't overfill the drives, causing them to crash. And so it's actually a good thing that they've got that, but especially as you get huge arrays, it can kind of get cumbersome. So you will end up with 70 usable terabytes before DSM takes its chunk. And so that's not too big of a deal for the larger bays. However, when you've got one bay, it's impossible. And if you've got two bays, you're taking up half of your storage. And so really that's what you need to be thinking about when you're selecting how many bays to have. So for one bays, it is a pretty small market because you don't get that hard drive redundancy I was talking about. And so one bay should really only be used for backups or data that is constantly backed up to the cloud. So having a one bay offsite backup is awesome because you can throw a 16 terabyte drive in there and be able to back up your NAS 
over the internet. And so if anything happens to your local site, such as fire or it gets stolen, you'll still have your most important data on there. And so that's a really great setup for one bay or say if you just need a time machine for your Mac, you don't want any of the fancy features for Synology. You just want to set up a time machine and back up your computers. Well, then one bay is totally fine because if it crashes, it's not the end of the world because you still have all the data on your main computer. I would not recommend putting any critical files on there that are not backed up anywhere else because hard drives will fail eventually. There's about a 3% chance per year that any drive fails. And so you should really think about that because hard drive recovery is incredibly expensive and doesn't work all the time. And so now let's go into the two bay models. Two bay models allow you to run RAID 1 or SHR1, meaning you have one disk of fault tolerant. However, it comes at a huge cost to your data you lose half of your data available to you. And so that is a tough sell. And so if you wanna run SHR1, which I would highly recommend, in a lot of ways, once you include the cost of the hard drives, it can actually be cheaper to buy a four bay over a two bay for the exact same storage. So say you wanna have a total of 12 terabytes of usable storage on your Synology NAS before Synology takes that 10% off the top. You gotta to remember that. So you have two different options. You can either go with a two bay or a four bay. The four bay is gonna be a little bit more expensive, but now let's talk about if you wanna include SHR where you have one disk of fault tolerance. So now to get that in the two bay, you're gonna to have to get two 12 terabyte drives. And if you go Iron Wolf drives, which are good NAS drives, it's gonna cost you, at least on Amazon right now, about $640 for those drives. All right, and so now let's talk about what hard drives you would need if you wanna do the same thing with 12 terabytes with one hard drive of redundancy in a four bay NAS. You would not need 12 terabyte drives. Instead, you would need four four terabyte drives, which are gonna be considerably cheaper than the two 12 terabyte drives. So if we look at four terabyte drive costs, they're about $104. And so four of them is gonna be about $420. And so this means you're gonna save about 240 bucks in hard drive costs, assuming you get Iron Wolf drives, just by upgrading from a two bay to a four bay. And so in a lot of cases, this can make the four bay cheaper overall. Another thing that comes with that is faster hard drive speeds because now you've got them in a larger RAID, which means you're gonna get increased write speeds and read speeds. And so in a lot of ways, this can be a really great option for you if you want that. Plus you end up with much higher storage possibilities over a two bay NAS. And so really that's why I would highly recommend going through and really figuring out the total cost of your NAS with the hard drives included. And so another thing you could do with a four bay NAS is you can just expand later on with SHR1, it's incredibly easy. So if you needed just eight terabytes for now and you thought maybe in the future you might need upgradability, well, you could start by buying two eight terabyte drives. Putting them in an SHR1 configuration will give you about eight terabytes usable at first, remember the 10%, so it's probably gonna be about seven terabytes at the end of the day starting off. Then as you need additional drives, you can just add them in, expanding your RAID pool. This allows for upgradability and a lower initial cost, which is a really great thing rather than having to trash the entire NAS or stop and get new hard drives. The one thing to note, spinning hard drives do take up a pretty considerable power usage when they're running. And so adding extra hard drives, even though it might be cheaper, could in the long run cost you more in power costs, depending on how much AC you need to run and how much your power cost is. Those are just some things you wanna factor in. For most people, it's not gonna to be too, too much. However, it can also be a little bit more noisy. Finally, for the five bay option, are really for people who are going to need a lot of storage. You can get massive amounts of storage in a Synology, easily over 100 terabytes in a very small desktop form factor. And so in a lot of cases, the sky's the limit for that. Finally, I touched on it earlier, but speed. When you combine a bunch of hard drives into a big array, you actually get much better sequential performance out of them because you're not reading from one drive, you're reading from five. And so if you wanna get really fast performance out of a 10 gigabit connection for sequential reads, you're going to want more drives. I found I was finally able to really saturate the thing at about seven bays in my DS1819 Plus all rated together in RAID 5, which is equivalent in my case to SHR1. And so by having that, I was finally able to basically have maximum read performance that my Synology is gonna put out. And so that's about how much I needed to really get fast performance 
though it is gonna vary based off of your hard drives. And honestly, how good your NAS is. At a certain point, you can start getting a CPU bottleneck and a network card bottleneck for really fast 10 gigabit connections. I would highly recommend enabling jumbo frames, but that's a whole different video that I've already touched on. All right, so that really concludes the number of bays you need. So now let's talk about BTRFS versus EXT4. BTRFS is Synology's not proprietary file system, but a file system they have championed. It is incredibly powerful. It supports thin snapshots, really great error correction, and even copy on write, which means if you duplicate a file, you don't double its size. You only store the deltas. And so BTRFS is a great feature, especially for businesses who want to be able to roll back files for users and really get the most out of their NAS. And so compatibility with BTRFS is something that's really nice on Synology's. Otherwise you use ext4. If you're already gonna use ext4, it doesn't matter. But BTRFS is something you should look for in your models. It's compatible with all plus series and some value series, but most of the J series do not support it. And so that is something to look for when you're choosing which Synology to buy. I've got a video on it and I'll leave that in the link in the description comparing BTRFS versus ext4. All right, so next up is number of network ports and type of network port. So there are really two different types of network ports built into Synology NASes. One gigabit ports and 10 gigabit ports. 10 gigabit comes in SFP plus or RJ45. RJ45 is the regular copper ethernet cables you think of that are like cat five, cat six, and things like that. SFP plus is generally over fiber, though you can do it over a special copper connection, but it's not your regular ethernet cable. And so in almost all user cases, the speed of the network connection is going to dictate how fast your Synology is. Most, if not all Synologies are gonna be able to saturate the one gigabit connection in sequential reads. And so really that one gig connection is going to be your bottleneck, meaning you're only going to be able to read and write to it at about 110 megabytes per second. Now, if you're using this over Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna be able to get those speeds in the most case. You can get pretty close. I can get Wi-Fi speeds of 70 megabytes read and write if I'm close to my router, but it's going to be incredibly varied even with Wi-Fi 6 because there's so much packet loss, it stuff has to be resent. And so if you're just running this over Wi-Fi, it really is probably not gonna to matter to you. But if you wanna have multiple computers connected to it, or a single computer connected to it over a 10 gigabit connection, you really need to start paying attention to the ports. So Synology's come in a few different flavors. There's one one gigabit port, two one gigabit ports, four one gigabit ports, and then some have one or two 10 gigabit ports built in or available via an expansion card. And so Synology's with one one gigabit port are really going to be the cheaper Synology's and they are going to not support what's called link aggregation. Link aggregation is essentially combining multiple ethernet cables together, if your switch supports it, to allow multiple simultaneous gigabit connections to it. This is not going to give a single user more than the one gigabit speeds. However, if multiple users are connecting to it simultaneously, it will allow them to both get their own gigabit speeds out of it, which means you can get really increased performance without having to upgrade to 10 gigabit hardware. But really for single users and people who are gonna be accessing it over Wi-Fi or mostly over the internet, you're not gonna see these speeds and so it really is not gonna matter. But if you've got a few different people who wanna be able to connect to it, having two or four ports that are in link aggregation can be really nice to have. I cover this in a video and I'll put that in the description below but having active link aggregation can not only give you faster speeds when you have multiple users connecting, but it also gives you failover protection. Meaning if one card fails, it still keeps running over the remaining ports. And so that's really nice to have if you're in an office environment where the entire NAS to go down because a single cable failed. And in multi-office environments where you're going to have a bunch of PCs over one gigabit connection, connecting to it, it can really speed things up for multiple users. And honestly, if you've got a bunch of different people doing random read and writes on it, and you don't have M.2 caching, you're probably not even gonna be able to saturate, in most cases, four gigabit connections, and so you probably don't even need a 10 gig card. However, if you have a few users who are all going to be connecting to it, that's when 10 gigabit really starts to take off, 
because they are much more likely to have sequential reads rather than a lot of users having random reads essentially. And so for most cases, there's really not gonna be a big difference for the smaller units having two versus four, especially if you only have about four drives. However, if you have eight bays, having only two gigabit connections is something you're probably going to be able to saturate. So that's why the DS1819 Plus comes with four of them, which makes it pretty hard to saturate if multiple people are connecting because of all those random read and writes. So now let's go on to the 10 gig options. So generally, Synologies do not have built-in 10 gig ports, and that's actually for a few different reasons. The primary one is 10 gig really comes in two different flavors when you're in the industry. SFP Plus or RJ45. Most 10 gig switches actually are way cheaper when you get them at SFP Plus because it's so much easier to fire that over optical, which has very low data loss, and it's just what the backbone is. 10 gig is still mostly industry. It's breaking away from that pretty quickly, but still that is the standard. And so having the availability to add in your own card is why I think Synology doesn't see the need to add in 10 gig ports because I might want a 10 gig SFP plus port or a 10 gig RJ45 port. And so having built-in ports only really helps you if you're going with that standard, though most people I think who are gonna be buying this at home are probably gonna wanna to be buying the RJ45 variant. And that's actually what they've started shipping with some of their new 21 models, which are awesome to have. And so for the most part, 10 gig switches are still pretty expensive, though I do have a video on the Netgear 10 gig switch which offers two 10 gig ports, which is perfect for most people who just have a single connection that they want at 10 gig speeds, but want the rest of the network to also be able to access this. Or what you can also do is directly connect your 10 gig card on your Synology to a computer. That means that you don't need to buy a switch and for one computer, it's super easy to use. That means you don't have to deal with the switch or anything else and your one computer gets incredibly fast performance and use the remaining gigabit ports to hook up to your regular network. This gives you the best of both worlds for honestly pretty cheap. And so that's what a lot of people have done, and I've also got a video on that that I'll leave in the description below. All right, so I hope that helps clear up the different options you've got when you're talking about networking ports on a Synology NAS. Next up, something that goes pretty hand in hand with networking is M.2 caching. So M.2 caching is essentially a really, really, really fast SSD that is used to store files that are used often instead of putting it on the hard drives. This is not gonna help you that much with sequential reads or single user performance, unless you're doing something special like Final Cut Pro, where when you're scrubbing through a timeline, there are a ton of random read and writes that can really slow down a hard drive array. However, if they were cached, it would be much faster because SSDs have incredibly low access times because there are no moving parts. And so M.2 caching is finally making its way onto a lot of the Synologies built in, which I think is a great thing to have, especially for multi-office, multi-user environment. If you've got a bunch of users connecting to your Synology, having M.2 caching is really gonna speed things up in most cases, because a lot of them are probably going to be accessing similar files. That means that it can be read from the cache which is way faster than trying to read it on the hard drive, especially when you're getting hit with a ton of random reads and the arrays have to keep moving. And so if you're one of those users who's gonna have a lot of different people connecting to it all at the same time, looking out for M.2 caching is something that's really good to have because it gives you expandability and a lot better performance. It can also just make your DSM feel snappier, though I think a lot of that is a bit of, hey, I'm looking for this so it feels faster kind of a thing rather than anything. Another big thing this helps out is virtual machines. If you're running multiple virtual machines, having them on an SSD volume or a volume with SSD caching is really gonna help them out because operating systems love SSDs because when they have to find files for the operating system, they get them almost instantly. And operating systems generally have a ton of random reads for all the various things they need to do. And so that's why having them cached will make the entire virtual machine just run faster. Another thing to look at is the PCIe expandability with the M.2. And so not all models that support PCIe expandability have the ability to take the card that has M.2 slot and 10 gigabit card, meaning you get the best of both worlds. It takes what's called PCIe bifurcation, I think I'm pronouncing that right, to be able to do this. And a lot of the boards do not have that capability. And so you need to watch out if you're buying this card to make sure it actually supports it. 
but if you can, it does give you the best of both worlds by giving you a 10 gigabit card and a M.2 cache all in the exact same PCIe slot. All right, so now let's start talking about some more performance things. And that's gonna be really two different things, the CPU and the RAM. So first let's talk on the CPUs. If you're just doing a couple of things with your Synology and not running virtual machines or a lot of Docker containers, the CPU is not that big of a deal. Most of these will have enough speed to be able to saturate a gigabit connection. So if you just need that, in a lot of cases, the CPU is not that big of a deal. However, if you wanna run Docker containers, virtual machines, or start using Plex for video transcoding, that's where the CPU really becomes very important to you because a lot of them will just slow down so much if you're trying to do a lot of things all at once. And so having a more powerful CPU really starts to matter the more you do on it and the more people connecting. If you start having a lot of people connecting to it, you're gonna want at least a quad core or if you're gonna to wanna to run really any powerful virtual machines at all. You can run a virtual machine on a two core. However, you're really gonna to wanna to stand to a Linux distribution because they're generally a lot quicker and it's still gonna be kinda of slow in a lot of ways but a two core can handle it. There are a lot better articles out there about what CPU to buy. And honestly, I'm not the authority on that. So I would recommend looking into the CPU on there. And do note, a lot of people in forums are going to just complain about whatever CPU they stick in there because they're like, oh, it's not powerful enough. Really, Synology's bank on having very low power draw and are very quiet. And so for most people, the CPU doesn't matter as much as forums would lead you to believe. But for people who wanna do a ton of stuff, that's really when you need to look into your CPU. Next up is RAM. RAM is going to matter to just about everybody. RAM not only allows you to run more virtual machines, but it also allows you to store more things in cache. And really there are a few different flavors of RAM on Synology. There is built-in RAM that is not expandable. There is built-in RAM that's expandable one slot and two slots. And then there are also some that have tons of bays. But for most people, they're going to get either non-expandable or expandable via one or two slots. And so having more RAM in your NAS will really make transfers go faster and will generally cache things that you do a lot and make the entire process faster. Especially if you start having multiple people connecting, that's when you're really going to need to start upgrading your RAM. And a lot of the Plus models support RAM upgradability Though the lower models generally have built-in RAM that's non-upgradable, and sometimes it's as low as 500 megs, which is just not enough RAM if you start trying to do more powerful things. Though once again, if it's just a backup, who cares if it's slow? It's not going to slow you down enough where you're going to notice it versus anything else. But where you really need to look into RAM are your virtual machines, your Docker containers, multi-users, and just general speediness of the UI, as well as different files that are available on there. And so those are people who really want to look into more RAM. And I've got a video on how to upgrade my DS1819 Plus. And after I did it, I did notice things were just snappier. Any unused RAM by the operating system ends up just being an incredibly fast cache, which is great for people, especially if you're writing to it. It actually uses the RAM as a slight buffer sometimes. And so multi-users really want RAM. All right, so now let's talk about Docker and virtual machines. This is another line between the Plus model, the Value Series, and the J Series. So Plus models, almost every single one of them, I think every single one of them, supports Docker and virtualization, which are really nice things to do. This means you can run applications and really make your NAS a home automation instrument rather than just network storage. And so if you're a tinker and would like to be able to try different things and run a lot of different things, probably watching this YouTube channel, you really are going to want to be able to run virtual machines and Docker. All right, so now I've got a few things we gotta close off with. NVR support. For the most part, most non-NVR NASes, unless they've got really powerful CPUs, probably about four cameras max, though there's better documentation out there. So if you wanna run IP cameras and you wanna run a lot of them for business and do all the cool deep learning stuff that Synology has now, I would really recommend looking into the NVR options and maybe even just having a separate option. Plus, if you start buying a lot of licenses, having an NVR NAS, which comes with licenses, can actually really offset that cost, and having a separate unit, never a bad idea. Especially given the rights are just very different than what most file systems are gonna use. 
And so having a separate NAS that just handles all the NVR stuff will make your main NAS more snappy because it's not gonna be constantly bombarded with these video feeds, taking up both the CPU and the disks. So I would recommend looking at Synology's great tool for how many IP cameras you've got and which NASes are possible. It breaks it down by how long you'd like to store the footage and everything like that and really tells you the exact specs you're gonna need. It's a great utility. Next up, hardware encryption. So most NASes support encryption, though not all of them have built-in hardware encryption. Built-in hardware encryption offloads the CPU, meaning that huge sequential writes to an encrypted drive go much faster. That's because encryption is a very intense algorithm in a lot of cases that will just take up a lot of CPU time, which means the CPU cannot be doing other things. If you've got a chip that offloads it, then the custom built chip is gonna be way faster at encryption than the CPU will be, meaning your CPU is not bottlenecked as much. It really matters once you start getting above 10 gigs it really matters once you start getting above gigabit connections or having multiple people bogging down your CPU. But for the most part, it really comes down to whether or not you think encryption is right for you. And I would recommend having some files encrypted, some files not. It really depends on your exact use cases. Next up is power consumption slash noise. Generally, the desktop NASes from Synology are going to be very quiet and draw very little power. That's because they don't have the most upgraded CPUs in all the latest tech. They have good, dependable CPUs, and everything's designed to be low power consumption. And so I would really recommend looking at this because it adds up over time compared to something like a used Dell, which is just going to suck a ton of power out. And so having a quiet desktop NAS that draws next to no power is a really great benefit of Synology. And so looking at the different power draws is a good thing to check out, knowing what you're getting yourself into. Some of the more upgraded models might draw a little bit more, but generally it's pretty low. All right, and so finally, the last thing to check out is upgradability. And it really depends on who you are. And so really there are just three different ways you can upgrade a Synology is one, PCIe upgradability, adding in 10 gig cards or M.2 caching. Two is upgrading the RAM later on. This is for NASAs that have one or two upgradable slots, which is a really nice thing to have if you find you're running out of RAM or things feel slow because you're running a lot of virtual machines taking up a lot of your RAM. And finally, the expansion bays. So a lot of the Plus series, if not all the Plus series, support an expansion bay. And I don't know how I feel about this. It's definitely good because it's gonna reduce e-waste, though they are kind of clunky and they're only five bays. And so that means if you wanna run RAID 5 on them, you only get about four drives of storage, which is kind of not as much as I'd like for a expansion. Then if you're running two of them, it just loses that form factor that's so great with Synology. I would love to see how many sales Synology actually has with these because I don't think it's that many because I, I really wish they were like 10 drive ones where you could add in a ton more drives and making it more worth it. But having that upgrade ability down the line, if you do run into it and need it, is a really great thing to have because it's a cheap way to upgrade and add more storage to your NAS. Though remember, you are going to need to split it off into a new volume, which does kind of suck. All right, well, I think we finally reached the end of this video. I know it was a long one, but I really hope this helped go through what different things to look for when you're looking at a NAS. And I'll leave a link to my site, which is gonna go over the most popular NASs and which categories each of them have in this list. All right. Well, go ahead and leave any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below. And honestly, what Synology you're looking forward to most in 2021. All right, have a good one. Bye.